नमस्कार टुडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ डिक्लेरेशन ऑफ मोरिटोरियम एंड पब्लिक अनाउंसमेंट अंडर द इन्सॉल्वेंसी एंड बैंक कोड ट्वेंटी एंड द रेलिवेंट जुडिशियल प्रोनाउंसमेंट ऑन मोरिटोरियम एंड टुडे आई हैव अलॉन्ग विथ मी मिस्टर राजेश कुमार ही इज जनरल मैनेजर इन इन्सॉल्वेंसी एंड बैंक बोर्ड ऑफ इंडिया एज इन द डिविजन ऑफ एडजुडिकेशन एंड प्रोसिक्यूशन एंड ही इज एन एडवोकेट एंड द एक्सपर्ट so before we begin let's uh, look into the terms that are essential to understand the entire scheme of the code the first term is insolvency and the other term is bankruptcy so we have to understand is it the same thing or do they have different meanings so insolvency is the inability to pay one's debt when the debt has become due so it means that when a corporate person is unable to pay his debt and the debt has matured then any creditor or uh, the corporate debtor himself can initiate the insolvency process against the corporate debtor whereas bankruptcy on the other hand is essentially a court order under which a bankruptcy trustee is uh, appointed and it is the bankruptcy trustee uh, who deals with the unpaid obligations of the insolvent individual so the difference between insolvency and bankruptcy is that uh, insolvency is in regards to corporate person whereas bankruptcy is in regards to individuals so before we continue now let's look at the snapshot of timeline as to how the insolvency and bankruptcy code came into picture and uh, what was the reason to have brought this code into effect so on august 2014 the bankruptcy law reforms committee was formed thereafter on 5th may 2016 the code was passed by lok sabha and on 11th may 2016 the code was passed by the rajya sabha thereafter on 28th may finally the code was brought into effect after it uh, gained the assent of the president and uh, finally on october 2016 the insolvency and bankruptcy board of india was established and uh, the members to the board were appointed so now let's try and understand what was the reason for having brought this code into enactment so earlier in the early 2010s the corporates had taken a lot of uh, loans from the banks however they were unable to repay these loans because of a uh, slump in certain sectors of the market such as the steel infrastructure uh, commodities so and power so and uh, these companies were unable to pay their loans and the for the banks they had to set aside a portion of their profit for provisioning against uh, these bad loans these bad debts so this affected the profitability not just of the bank but also of the corporates also there was the issue of uh, increase in willful defaults and thirdly a lot of new companies were coming up and a lot of startups were coming up however they had no exit plans as such and the winding up processes would used to take a long period of time to resolve for multiple years these processes would continue and uh, the corporates their assets would be languishing in the court and uh, the promoters and directors of these companies would strip these companies of their asset and nothing would be left for the employees and the workers therefore there was a need for having a code enacted through which uh, the resource were effectively allocated to such areas where there was a necessity for the same so now let's try and understand what exactly is the insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 and the objective for the same so this is an act as per the preamble of the code this is an act which consolidates and amends the law so there were previous insolvency laws such as the provincial and presidential insolvency act and there was winding a provision under the companies act so these previous laws were present however now the with the assent of uh, insolvency and bankruptcy court all these laws are consolidated under a single umbrella and uh, this is a one stop process for all insolvency winding up liquidation processes and this relates to reorganization and insolvency resolution of the corporate persons partnership firms as well as individuals and this has to be conducted in a time bound manner so what is the reason for having it in a time bound manner because uh, for example this irp process is to be completed within a period of 180 days with additional 90 days which is the discretion of the adjudicating authority 
and uh, including the litigation period it has to be completed in a holistic manner within 330 days so the reason for having it in such a time bound process is that there has to be a maximization of value of these assets the longer the longer the assets are lying fallow unutilized there will be depreciation of these uh, the value of the assets if the machinery are not being utilized and the staff or the employees of the corporate debtors are not functioning then there will be there will be a uh, depreciation of the value and of the corporate debtor and uh, the there will be erosion of the value of the assets so there must be a maximization of value of the assets which is also one of the major features for this code this also promotes entrepreneurship availability of credit and balances the interests of all stakeholders so what happened was in the earlier legislation whoever approaches the judicial forum would receive the remedy however under this present code if any person regardless whether it is the creditor or the corporate debtor itself filing the application once the application is admitted into insolvency all the stakeholders are involved so if uh, all these stakeholder any individual stakeholder can file their claim to the resolution professional and the resolution would be for the holistic for the collective stakeholders not just for the person who had initiated the insolvency proceeding so in this regard it takes care of the interest of all the stakeholders also there has been an alteration in order of priority of payment of the government dues earlier the government dues were given a higher priority than in the present uh, scheme of the code this is because the government was of the opinion if insolvency is triggered of a corporate debtor that should not result in insolvency or a trigger of insolvency for all these minor single uh, investors or small individual businesses so for that reason the government has uh, decided to take a step back and allow all these minor and small uh, investors to recover their losses recoup their losses and uh, once the economy is up and running once the corporate debtor is up and running then uh, then the government can uh, get back its revenue also this code establishes a insolvency and bankruptcy board of india which is the principal regulator now let's try and understand what is the process of the code what are the stepwise process and the timeline and in what stage does the moratorium and public announcement comes into picture so that uh, we can understand what exactly is the effect of the moratorium or a public announcement so the first stage stage is when there is a debt due or a default of a minimum amount of 1 crore then the operational creditor the financial creditor or the corporate debtor himself can initiate the insolvency process and the adjudicating authority on being satisfied that there has been indeed a default of 1 crore can admit the insolvency application and then the by the admission order the adjudicating authority can appoint an interim resolution professional as well as uh, uh, declare a period of moratorium now the interim resolution professional is required to publish the public announcement in a daily newspaper so that the audience at large so that the public at large can decide if they want to submit their claim and they become aware that insolvency of a corporate is being undergoing the uh, insolvency of such and such corporate de debtor is undergoing and uh, they may decide to submit their respective claims thereafter on the basis of the claims that have been submitted by these uh, claimants uh, after seeing the public announcement a committee of creditor is formed out of the numbers of uh, number of claimants and those persons who have a financial debt as in they have lent money to the corporate debtor and there is a time value to such investment that is attached then those parties are called to sit in the committee of creditors and uh, this committee of creditor is responsible for taking all the major decision regarding the fate of the corporate debtor for example they decide whether the resolution plan is to be approved or not they decide what sort of interim finance they are going to take in so that is the role of the committee of creditors and thereafter the resolution professional is required to appoint a valuer so that a valuation can be conducted of the corporate debtor valuation as in what is the value of the corporate debtor what price it will fetch in the market or if all the assets are sold 
in a piecemeal manner what price that will uh, get from the market so based on this valuation the resolution professional is required to publish an interim uh, to publish a information memorandum so this information memorandum has the particular details of all the corporate debtors such as uh, what are the claimants and the creditors that have submitted the claims what is the total number of claims that have been uh, total amount of claim that has been submitted the valuation of the corporate debtor and based on this information memorandum an expression of interest is uh, uh, published in a daily newspaper inviting the inviting the prospective resolution applicants now these prospective resolution applicants are required to submit their uh, resolution plan if they are desirous of bidding for the corporate debtor they will submit their resolution plan now all these resolution plans are tabled before the committee of creditors who will decide which is the best viable and the most feasible resolution plan for them how much haircut they are willing to take and based on the exercise of their commercial wisdom the committee of creditor will finalize the best resolution plan and this resolution plan then will be placed before the adjudicating authority the adjudicating authority will then verify what are the legal incidents that are to be complied with what is the statutory compliance that has been made in the resolution plan and it if it is seen that it is up to par then uh, the resolution plan is approved if the resolution plan is not approved however then it will go into liquidation and once the resolution plan is approved it is binding not just on the resolution applicant or the committee of creditors but on against all the stakeholders including the government so as we had discussed earlier the cirp is a time bound process it has to be completed in a timely manner within 270 days or there will be erosion of the assets of the corporate debtor and including the litigation period it will have to be completed within a period of 330 days also there is a fast fast track cirp which is to be completed within 135 days and the compulsory liquidation period is to be completed within one year so as you can see all these processes are time bound and they have to be completed and conducted in a organized manner with without unnecessary delay now section 13 now coming to the topic at hand section 13 is regarding declaration of moratorium and public announcement so the adjudicating authority after admission of the application of insolvency may by an order declare a period of moratorium and also appoint an interim resolution professional and this resolution professional is required to publish a public announcement in daily newspaper calling for submissions of claim and uh, there will be a fixed time within which the claims are to be submitted by the uh, claimants who are desirous of uh, making such uh, claim against the corporate debtor and uh, along with the proof to prove that such claim has been incurred that such debt has been incurred by the corporate debtor against them so section 14 of the code is regarding moratorium it defines moratorium as the adjudicating authority by its order declares a period of moratorium wherein no judicial proceedings for recovery enforcement of security interest sale or transfer of asset or termination of essential contracts can be instituted or continued against the corporate debtor so section 14 moratorium basically states that there cannot be any legal proceeding against the corporate debtor during the after the initiation of cirp and there cannot be any alienation or transfer of assets during this moratorium period so there has to be a calm period a uh, silent that is observed by all the stakeholder the silence is required because otherwise the committee of creditor will not be able to decide what is the direction the corporate debtor is to be taken a resolution is to be chalked out by this committee of creditor which is in the interest of all stakeholders but if all the stakeholders try to stake their claim on individual aspect of the assets of the corporate debtor then the committee of creditors will be distracted they will be swamped by multiple litigation so for this reason it is necessary that uh, there has to be a calm period and this moratorium is effective from the date of commencement of insolvency to the date of closure of insolvency now the date of closure of insolvency is uh, when the adjudicating authority finally approves the resolution plan and uh, otherwise if uh, the liquidation order is passed the insolvency will also come to an end so there are certain exceptions uh, namely three exceptions to moratorium 
the first being supply of essential goods or services which are critical to protect preserve the value of corporate debtor and manage its operation as going concern so certain essential goods or services which are uh, which are quintessential for the operation of the corporate debtor should not be terminated during the uh, moratorium period otherwise the corporate debtor would not be able to continue its operation such services like it or infrastructure or uh, goods such as raw materials which are very essential to the functioning to the operation of the con uh, corporate debtor have to be continued even during the moratorium period otherwise the company will again lose its value if it is not up and running or if it is not a going concern and any such transaction or agreements which are notified by the central government in consultation with the financial sector regulators is also an exception to the moratorium those are also excluded so government has been given power to make certain agreements and transactions uh, excluded from uh, moratorium period and the third is surety to the corporate uh, to the guarantee uh, to a corporate debtor so legal action can be initiated against the personal guarantor of the corporate debtor even though there is a moratorium against the corporate debtor legal action can be initiated against the personal guarantor now moving to section 15 which is public announcement uh, it is stated in the code that an insolvency professional has to make the public announcement as soon as he is appointed that is within 3 days from the date of commencement Three days from the appointment of interim resolution professional, and this public announcement is to be published in one English and in one regional language newspaper, which has wide circulation at the local uh, location of the registered office as well as the principal office of the corporate debtor, where it conducts its material business, and it it is also to be made available on the website of IBBI and that of the corporate debtor. the reason for having this public announcement is so that the market and the market participants and the interested stakeholders come to know that such a corporate debtor is now going to be uh, is going to be in uh, cirp process and uh, they may submit their uh, claims and submission to the resolution professional and uh, by submitting it on the website of the corporate debtor and ibbi it will have a wider reach so this is basically the reason uh, this provision has been given and uh, the public announcement calls for submission of claims against the corporate debtor and uh, to substantiate it proof must also be given to the resolution professional so these are the various particulars that have to be given in a public announcement such as name and address of the corporate debtor name of the authority with whom the corporate debtor is registered the last date for submission of claims the details of the interim resolution professional to whom such claims are to be addressed and if any false and misleading claim is being made then penalty for the same has to be specified as well and the date on which the cirp is being closed that date is also to be mentioned which is basically 180 days from the date of commencement of the cirp so that the uh, so that the constituents and the interested parties are aware when they will get a return on their claims so now looking at the judicial pronouncement on moratorium the first case is mohan raj versus shah brother ispat private limited in this case the honorable supreme court was seized with the issue whether section 138 of negotiable instrument act is uh, which is check bouncing is covered under the moratorium or not so the honorable supreme court was of the opinion that uh, section 138 is a quasi judicial is a quasi criminal uh, judicial proceeding and it is in the nature of uh, civil proceeding and not criminal proceeding because uh, because the intent of the legislature was not to not to punish the uh, punish the accused person but to compensate the aggrieved person so for this reason it is of a civil nature and uh, moratorium will be it will be covered under moratorium no 138 proceedings can be initiated against the corporate debtor during the moratorium period and this view was also reiterated in the case of anjali rathi versus today homes and infrastructure private limited wherein the honorable supreme court made the observation that uh, even though section 14 is applicable against the corporate debtor for section 138 individual directors and management are not immune to this proceedings action can be taken against them the second case is power grid corporation of india versus jyoti structures limited and in this case the delhi high court had interpreted the terms against the corporate debtor and proceedings 
it made the observation that proceedings under section 14 do not include all proceedings only those proceedings which are not beneficial to the corporate debtor will be covered under the moratorium such actions as uh, which endangers diminishes dissipate or impacts the assets of the corporate debtor are to be included under section 14 and such legal proceedings which are for the benefit of the corporate debtor are not to be included under section 14 of the code and the third case is indian overseas bank versus dinkati venkata subramanyam in this case the national company law appellate tribunal had made the observation that during the moratorium it is not for the financial creditor or the bank to recover or adjust amount from the account of the corporate debtor the financial creditor or the bank cannot adjust or settle the debt amount of the corporate debtor from the corporate debtor's account which is opened with them otherwise it will it will defeat the entire purpose of the cirp because the operational creditors or the stakeholders they will not get anything in return if all the banks decide to settle their own uh, claims so if a bank has a claim to be made against the corporate debtor then they can make that submission before the resolution plan and it will be dealt in a holistic manner a resolution plan will be drawn up as per the terms of resolution plan or as per the waterfall mechanism such claims will be paid so these are the three major uh, cases regarding moratorium now i would like to call upon mr rajesh kumar to shed some light on the jurisprudence on moratorium Uh, thank you tina uh, you have covered uh, regarding moratorium uh, briefly i want to add in this that uh, there is a concept of interim moratorium also uh, you must be knowing that uh, now this personal guarantors to corporate debtor that provision has been notified by that provision has been notified and thereafter this uh, proceedings are initiated against personal guarantors also personal guarantors they can themselves file uh, the application for nclt or drt or creditors also they can file in this case the moment application is filed from the day one of the filing of the application moratorium starts that is called interim moratorium and thereafter after receipt of report by interim resolution professional when nclt passes order of admission from the that date a final moratorium starts so this is first time in this with respect to personal guarantor this concept has come in case of corporate debt debtor moratorium doesn't start from the date of filing of the application moratorium starts after admission of the order passed by nclt and this uh, regarding this uh, jurisprudence <coughs> regarding jurisprudence this uh, uh, earlier this what type of uh, moratorium will be applicable moratorium means whether proceedings initiated by corporate debtor for the benefit of corporate debtor whether those proceedings whether moratorium will be applicable to, to that proceedings also it has been clarified that no any beneficial proceedings which are for the interest of the corporate debtor that will be continued suppose any corporate debtor had filed earlier some litigation for recovery of money of corporate debtor that proceedings will continue that proceedings will not be hit by moratorium suppose somebody violates moratorium what will happen provision has been made that yes moratorium should be there but if somebody violates moratorium period what will happen what is the uh, procedure for such uh, for such violators so if corporate debtor if he violates moratorium then in that case punishment is provided in section 74 subsection 1 of the insolvency and bankruptcy code he can be punished for a infringement for a period of 3 years which may extend to 5 years or fine may also be imposed which may be 1 lakh to 3 lakh rupees in the like manner if moratorium is violated by creditors in some cases creditors also they can violate the moratorium in that case punishment is minimum 1 year which can be extended up to 5 years and uh, fine is up to minimum is 1 lakh rupees which can be extended to 1 crore rupees so how this uh, contravention can be can of moratorium can be made this corporate debtors what they do the suppose some accounts are not in the knowledge of interim resolution professionals and some amount is there in that account bank account they withdraw that amount during cirp once the case is admitted they cannot touch their any bank account all the bank account details they have to provide to interim resolution professionals if they have withdrawn any amount from that in that case that is, that is contravention and for that they will be punishable 
for punishment there is provision of filing criminal complaint under 236 of the court and whenever such contraventions are observed IVI files complaint before the special courts constituted by under Companies Act and that proceedings takes place. Like in like manner, this caters also, uh, some it has been found that in, in cases, in some caters, they have some account, but immediately they don't uh, disclose to intermediate professional that they have the account and uh, this much amount is lying. For uh, And they re recover it towards their dues. That is also not permissible. If they do this, that is contravention of the court and they cannot, uh, and that is punishable. So these are the, this, uh, uh, some provisions and <coughs> which, uh, uh, which relates to moratorium. Anything else, Tuina, you want to add in that? Uh, sir, please, if you can clarify regarding the criminal cases, whether they are covered under the moratorium and if not, why? The intent of the legislation is, is a beneficial legislation. The intent of the legislation is to resolve the corporate debtor. So if any, suppose some criminal case is there and the, that affects the resolution of the corporate debtor, then in that case, it will be for the benefit of corporate debtor. Like that th section 32A has come. Section 32A says that once the resolution plan is approved by the NCLT, after that, whatever criminal proceedings are initiated, that will cease. So that benefit corporate debtors will have of 30, uh, section 32A of the code. Any other thing? Uh, just adding to the issue, so the reason the moratorium or this calm period is uh, observed, like I had mentioned earlier, was so that all these creditors can decide what should be the fate of the corporate debtor. Otherwise, if the individual stakeholders were to take matter in their own hands and file applications before the adjudicating authority or before other proceedings uh, before various uh, tribunals and courts, then there cannot be any resolution for the corporate debtor. And as it is cases before uh, various judicial uh, judicial forums takes a long time to resolve. So for this reason, there is a requirement of having a moratorium period so that all these parties can in a in a organized manner decide uh, what should be what should how this process to be is to be completed and how the corporate debtor is to be resolved. So whole idea is to get the company resolved. How resolution should take place. And for that matter only if moratorium is not there, then if any creditor, any party can file any litigation against the corporate debtor and that, that will delay the process. So for that matter, a provision has been made for moratorium that if any proceeding, CRP proceeding is initiated, then no further proceeding against the interest of corporate debtor can be initiated by anybody. If any beneficial provision is there, like arbitration, uh, arbitration uh, uh, proceedings, if any arbitration proceeding is going on, that will also be a state. Because arbitration, if that, that harms uh, the corporate debtor. If corporate debtor has initiated uh, arbitration proceedings for getting its dues, that will continue. But if any arbitration proceeding has been initiated against corporate debtor for recovery of debt, for recovery of some amount, that proceedings will not continue. If some arbitration award has been passed against corporate debtor, that arbitration award cannot be enforced during moratorium. Arbitration award must have been passed, but if it is for the recovery of money from corporate debtor, it is against corporate debtor, then that arbitration award cannot be enforced during the period of moratorium. Also, in the case of P. Mohan Raj versus Shaha Brother Ispath Private Limited, it was made the the observation was made that the sweep of the provision is very wide indeed, as it includes institution, continuation, judgment, and execution of suits and proceeding, and an award of arbitration uh, arbitration panel or an order of an authority is also included. So the moratorium is very wide and it would include not just institution, continuation or judgment and execution but also arbitration award, especially those which are against the interest of the corporate debtor, those which uh, allows for transferring or alienation of the assets of the corporate debtor and those provisions which are for the beneficial benefit of the corporate debtor, those would be excluded from the moratorium. And this moratorium is applicable only for the corporate debtor. If corporate debtor is having some subsidiary, then this moratorium is not applicable for the subsidiaries companies. 
So corporate, this provision is applicable moratorium against if if suppose against subsidiary also CRP has been initiated, then moratorium will be applicable. But if CRP has been initiated, insolvency proceeding has been initiated against corporate debtor only, not any of its subsidiary company, then against subsidiary company moratorium will not be applicable. Any creditor or anybody who wants to initiate any action against subsidiary company of the corporate debtor against whom CRP proceeding has been initiated, they can do. There are many EPC contractors against whom insolvency proceeding is going on and they are having many subsidiary companies also. So if subsidiary, uh, against such subsidiary companies, independent proceedings have been initiated in that, that will, CRP will be applicable. But if against subsidiary company, no CRP proceeding has been initiated and admitted by NCLT, then motorism will not be applicable against such subsidiary company. Any other thing? I think.